Well, good morning. Welcome to the gathering. Uh, my name is Peter, and it's great to be here with you this morning, this Super Bowl Sunday. And um, a couple of logistical things as we get our morning started. Um, if you'd like to sing along with us, if you go to our website, thegatheringchurch.net, thegatheringchurch.net, right on the homepage there it says Sunday Song Sheet. You can click on it, and it'll pull up the lyrics uh, for the songs that we're going to sing this morning. And then I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness through this almost a year now of us not being able to gather, just your faithfulness in terms of tithing and giving. Um, it's been able to help us uh, sustain the ministry of this church, and you can continue to do that by giving online. You can go to um, our, our website and just click on giving, and you can go there, or you can text it in, you can mail it in, you can come by here and drop it off. So know that there's a lot of different ways to give in the way that you feel comfortable. But again, we are very grateful and very thankful. So as I begin every Sunday, and I think it's really, really important, it's, it's the value that we have here as a church community, we believe that following Jesus is the best way to live. And we are learning how to do that by learning how to live and love like Jesus in our everyday lives. And our hope is that as we do that each and every day throughout our week, is that others will be drawn to the Jesus that they are seeing in us. And it's in that spirit that we gather in moments like this to celebrate this life that we're living. It's a chance for us to, to learn, to grow, to be challenged, to kind of get recalibrated for the coming week. It is a chance to celebrate. Um, it's, a, it's a time where God can speak into our lives maybe in a way that he hasn't been able to this past week because we've been so busy just living into it. Um, so, as we worship this morning, know that that's the spirit with which we come. So, I was thinking um, this week about people that we look to um, in terms of leaders, in terms of people that have authority over our lives. And um, Jesus spoke about this idea of a kingdom. Um, he, would, he would say, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is near. And then as we come to know, Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And I was reflecting on that. If Jesus is king of a kingdom, a kingdom that he brought here for you and I to live into, what does that kingdom look like? As a king, what does he look like as a king? And I wrote down these, these thoughts that I had. You know, instead of power, Jesus as king chose to love. Instead of seeking wealth, Jesus as king led a life of self-sacrifice. Instead of seeking comfort and prestige, which he could have, Jesus chose to serve others. Instead of demanding and demanding of people and demanding of situations, Jesus chose to be patient. Instead of using force or violence to get what he wanted to be accomplished, Jesus healed. Instead of judging others, Jesus extended mercy and he forgave. Jesus said, you know, this kingdom that I'm about isn't from this world, and it's radically different. So as we sing this morning, this is the king who that we are singing to. The king and the kingdom that he's called us to establish in our lives and the lives of others. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is here. And God has crowned Jesus as our king. So know that our king recognizes our lives right now. He recognizes how we're feeling. He recognizes the life that we're living in. And our king this morning would say, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest.
darkness tries to roll over my bones and sorrow comes to steal the joy I have when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken oh my faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind.
it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Your love is extravagant. It's amazing. It's overwhelming. It's, it's magnificent. And Lord, our world needs love right now. Our love needs, um, our love needs to be experienced. The love that you have for us needs to be received. And the love that you have for us needs to be extended. Oh Lord, I, I don't ever want to take love for granted. And at the same time, Lord, um, a lot of love's missing. Uh, Lord, I want to lift up those in our community, in our state, and in our country, and throughout the world that need your love right now. You know what's going on in their lives. You know the experience they're having today. For some, it's hunger. For some, it's thirst. For some, it's sickness. For some, it's the experience of losing someone to death. For some, it's because of such great divisions and lost friendships and brokenness in families. For some, it's, it's lost hope and they need love. Uh, Lord, I, I just call on your love to, to be all that it is and more in our lives. And it's in the end that your love heals and restores. And we are thankful that, that you understand that and that your son Jesus, our king, exemplified that. Uh, Lord, help us to be more like him, that we might bring healing and establish the unity and family that you desire in your people. Um, Lord, thank you for your offering Thank you for the way in which you bless us. Uh, we lift up all of our tithes and offerings this morning to you as well, that you would use them to sustain us as we, as a church, just try to live out your love in this town. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I think I switch gears here. Move a few things out of the way. All right. Well, I have a few announcements for us this morning before we um, dive into something I want to share with you today. Um, if you do have a Bible or Bible app on your phone, if you want to get that out, we are going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 13. A passage many of us know, but you could be turning to that. Um, so first of all, um, if you're new with us, you're following with us online, you can go to our website, thegatheringchurch.net, and there's a circle, big circle on the webpage, the homepage says, I'm new, and you could click on that, and you could give us some basic information, if anything, just your email address, so we can keep you in the loop of what God's doing here in our church. And we are excited in the midst of this long season we've been in, of how God is preparing us uh, for what he has next, what he has in store uh, for us in our town here. Um, secondly, uh, we mentioned this last week, but we're preparing for next. And so part of it is devoting some time and energy to the kids' wing of our church. And we need a painting team. And so if you want to, you could comment right now. If you're on Facebook, you could comment, I'm in. I want to help paint um, and let us know. But it's kind of exciting. We're going to paint and we're going to put in new carpet so that when we gather back in the facility, the kids know how much we love them, how much a priority they are to us, that we've devoted a whole section of our building to them. So let us know. If you have my phone number, you can text me, you can email me, however you want to communicate. Just say, I want to paint. And uh, I'll let Phil, who oversees our facility stuff, know that you want to paint. Um, another thing I want to encourage us to do is to stay connected. I mean, it's, I've found it really hard to do that. I'm an in-person guy. So I have always found the phone to be very difficult. I mean, I, I can text people and say I'm praying for them and, hi, how are you doing? We do emojis back and forth and stuff. But, but I'm a people person, and so it's really hard. And I find myself at times just not even doing that. 
So I want to encourage us to stay connected in any way that we can. Make those phone calls. If God puts someone on your heart, make that phone call. Call somebody. Ask how they're doing. Ask if they need anything. And ask how you can pray for them. And I really want to encourage us to do that, not only in our church family, but to do that with our neighbors and our friends and even coworkers uh, that we have in our lives. Um, thirdly, we have a men's retreat. We had a women's retreat in the fall, which was awesome. It was virtual. Who's, who's ever heard of doing a virtual retreat where you don't even go anywhere, you stay here? And you, yeah, so, so anyway, the men, men, you're not being left out. So save this date, March 20th, Saturday, March 20th. We're going to have a men's retreat. The speakers are all lined up. Some of them are people you know well, and some of them aren't. But it's going to be a great day. And I'm praying that we'll be in the red so we can gather here. And um, we're going to just celebrate life uh, being together as guys again. So save that date. And then lastly, the food pantry continues to be a blessing to this town. And we are excited about that each and every week because we get to see God just do some amazing miracles. And every week we have a theme now of a food need. So this is what we need. We need pasta, noodles, like spaghetti noodles, pasta, and sauce to go with that. And it could be spaghetti sauce or it could be Alfredo or whatever you want. But that's what we're looking for is pasta and pasta sauce so that we can bless families with that. So I think that's all I have. All I have. All right. So today is, I guess, what we would consider a national holiday if we live in America. It's Super Bowl Sunday. And what a unique way to celebrate the Super Bowl in isolation in many ways. Um, but I know people are going to gather. And you know what's really cool about, about the Super Bowl? Um, you know, I, we all watch it, even if our favorite team didn't get there, you know. And, you know, honestly, I'll wear my Niner jersey today, even though my team's not in it but I will enjoy watching the Super Bowl. My heart's not as vested in it because um, I don't really care necessarily who wins. And I'm in a quandary this year. You know, Tom Brady, the Buccaneers, really another one. And then, and then Kansas City, they're just dominating the NFL. Really? I really don't know who to cheer for. But you know what's interesting is we can sit and we can watch these football games with our jerseys of our favorite teams and we can celebrate the Super Bowl moment. And there's really no arguments, there's no division, there's nothing that happens, you know? We all love football and we all have our favorite team. Well, I have to tell you, I I was reflecting on this a little bit about growing up. Um, I have a brother and his name is James and he's a couple years younger than I am. And I have to tell you, when James came into this world, um, I'm a people person and I loved having someone else in my playpen. I loved my brother. And my brother and I, as we grew up, man, we did everything together. We were best friends. I mean, his friends were my friends, and my friends were his friends. I don't remember a moment growing up in my early childhood where James and I weren't doing everything together. We had this moment, though. And I I don't recall, I'm trying to nail down how old we were. Maybe doesn't matter. But you need to know this. I was a diehard 49er fan. And my brother, a diehard Raider fan. In fact, my brother's best friends, their dad was a coach of the Raiders. Now, if you remember back in the 70s, which many of you may not, but I'm dating myself here, um, the 49ers, we kind of had moments. But the Raiders, man, they had lots of moments. And if you recall, there was this team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, who just kept raining on the Raiders parade. And I remember there was one game, and it must have been a playoff game, and of course, my Niners weren't in it. And I remember watching the game, and my brother's heart was in this. I mean, he lived and died by the victory or the loss of the Raiders. And the Raiders lost that day. And I, being older and being selfish and foolish, made remarks and everything about my brother being upset about it. And all of a sudden, we weren't quite as close as we were before. And it wasn't just that football game. What started to happen is we began to do different things, and our life sort of started to to distance itself. My mom has a picture of my brother and I at this age where I even grew more than my brother did. I was literally a foot taller than him, and we were great apart in school. And so as we went forward, I I think there was this this thing where, as a young teenager, I'm just living for myself selfishly, not even paying attention to what's going on in my brother's life. And my brother's growing up a year behind me in school, and he's trying to distance himself from me, finding his own identity and his own interests. 
And what happened was we began to grow apart. I remember in college, I moved out. And in moving out, the room we shared became his room. And I remember I came home from college for the summer and being selfish, self-centered, the older brother. I came back into what was now my brother's room and made it our room again. And if anything, in my selfishness, it was my room. And, and it did something. My brother went to college. I went to college. We focused on different things. My brother got a job, which ended up taking him across the United States. And somehow my brother, who was my best friend, we became very distant. And again, I was so focused on my life that I wasn't paying attention to his. And it really, it really felt like there was a void. My brother got a job back out here and he moved back. And we had moments where we were together as family, and I thought, you know, this is great being around James again, but there's something missing. It's not what it was. It's not what it was. Well, my mom and dad, as they got older, all of a sudden needed my brother and sister and I to come around them and begin to help take care of their life. Um, we were given powers of attorney. And in order for this to work, we needed to work together. And so now my brother and I were in interaction with one another as we were trying to take care of my mom and dad. And we began to interact. Unbeknownst to me, my brother began to ride a bike. And those of you who know me know I ride a bike a lot. And he called me one day and he said, Peter, you know, I, I want to get a, a, a decent bike and I don't know what to do. Can you help me buy a bike? And so I got to do that. And then my brother started to ride like I did. And when my body started to break down and my hips started to go and I couldn't, I couldn't ride anymore and I couldn't walk much, my brother still would come by the house on his bike when he was out on a ride to visit me and see how I was doing. My hips got better, um, but my brother, as he retired, this is about three years ago, riding his bike, super fit, super healthy, turned one day to grab a shirt in the closet, huge wrenching back pain, took him out, down on the ground, deep pain, and as he went to doctors, he discovered that he has a degenerative a spinal condition, and so for the past three years, my brother, the doctors have not been able to help him, and my brother has had to navigate through excruciating pain that comes and goes as his Discs in his back slowly degenerate in the highs and the lows of that. I knew the pain my brother had because I had dealt with extreme hip pain. And so my compassion for that, it grabbed my heart. And so my brother and I, in our relationship with one another, it went deeper and deeper to the point that now I talk to my brother probably multiple times a week. And we have become close friends again. I reflect on that and I ask myself, what was it that brought us back together? It was a common love for my parents. It was a shared passion for something like riding a bike. But it was also a shared suffering. It was both having experienced a pain that we both understood in different ways, but we both had experienced a deep physical pain and it was shared suffering. A common love a shared passion, and a shared suffering. Today, you and I are living in what I consider a season of great exhaustion and great opportunity. Thomas Jefferson wrote this. A difference in politics should never be permitted to enter social discourse or to disturb its friendships, its charities, or justice. Let me read that again. A difference in politics should never be permitted to enter social discourse or to disturb its friendships, its charities, or justice. In our country, we have allowed politics to do just that. And we are more divided today than in my lifetime. And to many who look back over history, they would say, you'd have to go back to the Civil War to find that kind of division. 
It's been reported that one in six friendships have ended because people have stopped talking to one another. Many today, maybe you, are only wanting to spend time with those who think and believe the way that you do. For others, these differences have created elephants in the room, meaning it limits our conversations that we have with, another, with one another out of fear. If I say this, what might that bring up? And for many of us, that has caused us to lose the relational freedom we once had. For many of us, this other, free, this other um, viewpoint has caused an enemy, an adversary. In other words, those who don't think like I do are now the enemy. They're an adversary because they don't agree with what I agree with. But in the midst of this, I think there's great hope. There was a groundbreaking study on attitudes in the United States that a guy named Tim Dixon did. And he's a founder, I love the title of this, More in Common, an organization called More in Common. And this is what he discovered. And listen to this. Right now, 93% of Americans are exhausted by our divisions. 93% of Americans are exhausted from this divisive season that we've gone through and we're still living in and you know what 71 percent feel very strongly about this and they fear that if we don't overcome this it could lead to a failing in our country what's happened is we have forgotten what we have in common and we have allowed our differences to become deep convictions that have pushed us in directions away from the people we love the most and then from others who we have common life with. Um, I've been reading and listening to a lot of psychologists, um, theologians, sociologists, people who look at politics not from a partisan view, they just look at politics. A lot of these are non-believing people and it's interesting. They point to the way we overcome this. They point to the way back. They point to the bridge that will bridge this divide. And it's interesting. They say that the bridge is love. Love is the bridge back. It's not changing the way people think so they'll think like I do. The bridge is love. That is the way back. And you know what's neat? As followers of Jesus... We have been called to love one another and to love others. That's what we're called to do. Do you realize we, as followers of Jesus, we were made for this very moment. And we can show people the way back. So we can get those relationships back. And we can end this great divide. So let me pray. And uh, we'll, we'll dive in a little more. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about something that's important. Our love for one another. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open, our minds would be clear. I pray that what I share would be helpful, truthful, and pleasing to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you need to know that what we're in right now has happened throughout the centuries. It even happened in the life of the early church. We just went through the letter of Ephesians, Paul's letter to this young church in Ephesus, and he emphasized, he emphasized, in order for you to do life together as followers of Jesus, to do community, you have to bind yourselves together in peace. You need to be united in spirit and purpose, growing more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And you do this together. It's about unity. But it's interesting In that culture of the time, they ran into the same issues that we find ourselves in today. In fact, Paul writes this letter to a young leader in Ephesus of this same church, and his name's Timothy. And he he points out boldly, you got to pay attention to this. you got to pay attention to this. Listen to these words, and you don't need to turn to it if you don't want to. I'm in 2 Timothy 3. Paul says, you should know this, Timothy. That in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving 
and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Wow. All the division we're living in obviously is not the heart of God, is not what Jesus wants. And if you listen to all of those words, we've seen it. We've seen it in all kinds of different ways. So let me just, I really want to challenge us with this. You know, the Bible talks about people being prophetic voices in our lives. And many of us who've been Christians for a long time, been a part of the church, we we take prophecy as God gives someone a word and they speak it into our life. They speak it into our world. They speak it into our culture. The Bible's filled with prophets. And we get that. You know, it's a word from God and we take it that way. Um, We don't experience it that much today. And yet as followers of Jesus living in our culture today, this is what has happened. And it has created huge divides in us. We have allowed prophetic voices to speak in our lives. And those prophetic voices have come from the media. They have come from people who claim to know God. They have come from people who claim to have a faith. And they have spoken some wrong truths into our lives. And we have listened to those truths. And those truths have pushed us away from one another. The television and social media, we have allowed that to be prophetic voices of telling us what we should think and how we should feel, not realizing that they're feeding us what they think that we want to hear and they're moving us in directions we wouldn't want to go. We have been led astray. We have been led far away from the heart of God. And we have to silent those, pro- silent those prophetic voices in our lives. We have to acknowledge that that has happened. Those voices haven't pulled us together. I've been trying to watch the news just lately because of all the changes that are going on. And all I see is one side pushing against the other. It's continuing to push and push and push. And in many cases, they'll pull our faith, the words we know of our faith, into those conversations. And it's pushing us away from one another instead of drawing us back together. And if our country is going to heal, we have to be drawn together. Paul writes to another church. He writes this letter to the Colossians, another Church, and he says this to them. He says, above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Clothe yourselves in love for one another. Have the love that you have for for one another. Pull you together so that you can be one and let Jesus rule your heart. Because we're supposed to live in peace with one another. I sometimes wonder in congregations and we gather in spaces like this, if we said, who of you are Republicans? Raise your hand, stand up. And they would stand up and then the people that aren't would go, ooh, I didn't know that about you. Or what if we said, all of you that are Democrats, stand up. And everybody stands up. And then all of those that aren't look at them, and go, ooh, I didn't know that they were. And all of a sudden we have division. It's like, what the heck? What? Really? It's true. It's true. Churches are splitting up over this stuff. People are leaving churches over this stuff. Who told us that? Who told us that? People in my role didn't. People in my role didn't, hopefully. Paul writes this to the Romans. He says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What Paul is saying, despite all this stuff that's going on, you know what conquers it? Is love. The love in us. Our world has been shaken, very shaken. And we need to realize that God wants to have victory in our hearts through love so that he can use the love that he has put in us to have victory over all of the division and all of the hate that is out there around us. The writer of Revelation said this as he was writing to churches. It's all great, but he says this, it's time to return to the love we once had. It's time to return 
to our first love. You can claim all these other things, but you're far from me because you have left the love that I'm about. It's time to return to that. So you need to know that when Jesus came into the world, and we can forget this, he came into a very divided world. It was socially divided, culturally divided, politically divided, um, economically divided, religiously divided, racially divided. I mean, you, you, you name it, there was division. Jesus entered that world. And there was a group of people that were concerned about who this Jesus was because they were hearing that he was the Messiah. They were hearing that he was the king, claiming that people were saying he was that. So the religious leaders of the time, they come up to Jesus to totally trip him up, to create division. They said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? They're going, we're going to catch him on this one because he's going he's to answer this wrong. And Jesus told them exactly what he knew that they already knew. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Good answer. But Jesus, the king of a different kind of kingdom, takes it further. He says, equally, by the way, love others as you love yourself. And then if you follow Jesus around, he not only says that, he says, love your neighbor. And many of you know the story of the Good Samaritan. They ask him, who's your neighbor? Jesus comes back with that story. And literally with that story, the essence of it that I always grab in it is, your neighbor is the person on the other side of the road. Your neighbor is the person that you go to the other side of the street to go by because you don't want to get involved in their life. You choose to walk on the other side of the street than they're on. And then Jesus even takes it one step further with the greater challenge. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. For many of us, we like the second part of Jesus' statement there. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And we love to jump to the second part. Yeah, I want to know who all my enemies are so I can pray for them. Because they'd be messed up. I need to pray for them so they can get right. And then they won't be my enemy. That's not what Jesus is saying. (laughs) He's saying, love your enemy. Love your enemy. So, so what kind of love are we talking about here? Well, first of all, love is not an emotion, even though we love to feel that emotion, the love we have for another human being. I love Betsy, and I know she loves me. I love hearing her say the words, Peter, I love you. I love that. But you know what? Those are just words. It does feel emotional, but you know why those words impact me so much when she says them? There's action behind all of those words. Our actions are actually Love and action. Love is a verb. It's not a noun. It is a verb. So love is experienced through what we do. And then as we do that, we get to experience the emotional feeling of love. So let me say this. I think it's easy to love our friends. That's easy, right? Um, To love God, that's reachable. I think we can seek after. I think it's reachable. To love our neighbor, there, there's possibilities in that, you know, as long as we get along with that neighbor. To love our enemy, oh, that could seem pretty impossible. I sometimes wonder as the disciples followed Jesus around, you know, they were a diverse group of guys. They weren't all the same. I mean, you have a tax collector and you have fishermen. I mean, just right there, that's like totally different people. And we can't assume that the 12 disciples were all buddies and friends as they followed Jesus around. I think that as they followed Jesus around and they watched him in action, I think their love for one another grew. And all the things that could have divided them, their relationship grew deeper and deeper and closer and closer. So what is it about the way in which Jesus loved? What's a very practical thing? Well, this I know about Jesus. He loved all people. He loved all people. He listened to anyone. He respected everyone. He encouraged and helped anyone who would receive it. His love had absolutely no boundaries. And if you followed him around, you recognize that oftentimes he would violate all kinds of social boundaries. You're not supposed to go there, and Jesus would go there. And I think it's because Jesus saw the good in everyone. He knew that everyone was made in the image of God, and if they weren't living into that image, he had compassion. He did not judge them. Thomas Aquinas says this, to love 
is to will the good of the other. And I believe what that is saying is I look at another life and I see the good and the potential in them and I can put my hope in that love and I can love everybody. And I've spoken that here before of saying we need to look for the Jesus in everybody. There's a little bit of God's image in everybody if we'll just look for it. And Jesus could see that. Jesus loved people unconditionally. Unconditionally. And we know he did that by just looking at who he went to. I mean, he went to lepers. He went to tax collectors. He went to adulterers. I mean, Jesus, man, he, he knew no bounds in that. And to love unconditionally means you don't, you don't just love them and allow them to do and be anything. What it means to love unconditionally is you love them beyond their circumstance. You love them beyond the condition of their life. Jesus basically lived this way. He said, there's nothing that you could do or be that will ever stop me from loving you. Think about that. There's nothing you could do or be or say that could ever stop me from loving you. Paul writes this in Romans 8. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus is showing how, us how to love and there's nothing that can separate us from that love. And I always follow it up unless we allow it to. Unless we let it to. And the third way Jesus loved was he loved sacrificially. He loved sacrificially. He was willing to lay down his life so others could live. I've said this often in here that you want to have a healthy marriage, you recognize that it's a covenant of sacrifice. The husband is dying to himself so his wife's life can thrive. The wife coming into the marriage is dying to herself so that her husband's life can thrive. It's a mutual, sacrificial love. And that is the best marriage. Jesus understood that. He was willing to lay down his life and extend mercy to those who didn't even deserve it. To those who didn't even deserve it. 1 John 3.16, we know John 3.16, listen to 1 John 3.16, it's kind of similar. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, even when it's not deserved. That's what we call mercy. There's forgiveness, but mercy takes it to another step. It's where we extend a deep compassion through our forgiveness to someone who might have contempt against us, someone who might even want to harm us, someone who hates us. We love them sacrificially. And I think our world needs a lot of that right now. In other words, I'm willing to die to everything that I believe and think and all of that to love you. I'm not going to allow where I am to say I can't love you because you don't agree with where I am. Simon Garfunkel wrote a song Like a bridge over troubled water. I love that line. Like a bridge over troubled water. And we are living in a time that I believe our waters are really troubled. And we are called to love all people unconditionally, love them sacrificially. And we need to do it in very practical ways. And so I'm just going to read from 1 Corinthians 13. Very simply because I think it gives us the words that we need. This is what love is. Paul unpacks it for us. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous, boastful, or proud, or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no records of being wronged. It doesn't rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So I want us to think about this this week. It's Valentine's week. Valentine's Day is coming. I think next Sunday is actually Valentine's Day, for those of you who forgot. So let's try to do this this week. This week, let's be patient and kind to a friend. Let's be patient and kind to a neighbor. Let's be patient and kind to an enemy. This week, let's give up the need to be right 
to a friend, to a neighbor, to an enemy. This week, let's honor and put the needs of a friend, a neighbor, or an enemy above your own. This week, let's forgive with great mercy a friend, a neighbor, an enemy. This week, let's have great compassion for a friend, for a neighbor, for an enemy. This week, let's find reason to celebrate with a friend, a neighbor, or an enemy. And let me just say this, the last words, and don't stop loving. Never stop believing in love and out of love always have hope and perseverance in love through every circumstance for all people. Do you realize we have more in common with people than we recognize? We do have a shared passion that we have forgotten or maybe have yet to discover and we are living in a shared experience right now in our country and with all that goes with it. We are living in a shared experience. So let's each one of us do what we can to begin to build a bridge of love back and begin the healing that will bring our country out of the exhaustion of division and bring us back to our first love. Let the love of Jesus be our guide. As followers of Jesus, we were made for this moment. Do not look somewhere else for the healing to take place. The healing has to start within you and in your relationship with the people that God has placed around you. That is what is going to heal our nation. That is what's going to heal our nation. So, as I do every week, let's take a moment and um, reflect on what God may have spoken to you. And the big question always is, what did you hear, but then what are you actually going to do with what you heard? says in scripture we're able to love because God loved us first it's out of the love that God has for us we will receive it in the depth of all that that is that we'll be able to love others
pray a blessing over us as we go, and, uh, and then we can enjoy um, the Super Bowl in whatever manner we will do that. Hey, Heavenly Father, um, I just want to pray a blessing over all my friends, all my family, this community that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that you would watch over and guard and protect us, that in this season right now, we would be provided with everything that we need, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. Lord, I pray that this week we would discover the joy and the hope that come from you, the peace that goes beyond understanding as we choose this week to love our friends, our neighbors, and our enemies. And may through our lives, the healing begin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a great week, and um, we'll connect somehow. Connect somehow. And um, go Niners.